Hello, welcome back to Teen Story Share. This week we're starting a brand new book and we'll be reading this one for the month of February. This is A Face for Picasso by Ariel Henley and it is an autobiography. Usually we read mostly fiction on here, but every once in a while we jump into some non-fiction. I'm not going to do a whole lot of introduction. If you want to know more about the book ahead of time, you can check out the description down below. But for now, we're just going to jump right in and hear Ariel's story in her own words. Finding my voice. If you ask me about my childhood, I will tell you how magical it was. My twin sister, Zan, and I were the youngest of five kids, and together we grew up in a big white house that our father built and our mom decorated. It was a home filled with life. My siblings and I always had friends over, and if Zan and I weren't inside, we could be found playing on the swing set with the neighbors in the field behind our house. These were the stories I had planned to write about in my memoir because, at the end of the day, I want to normalize experiences like mine. But the more I wrote, the more I realized my childhood was anything but normal. I had a beautiful, privileged upbringing in so many ways, but my story is one rooted in the idea of beauty. So to write honestly about coming of age with Cruzon syndrome, I had to write about beauty through a lens of disfigurement. As a woman, I am defined by beauty, and as a woman with a facial difference, I am also defined by my very lack of the thing. This is a lesson I began learning in childhood. It's a lesson I want to destroy. Zan and I were born with Cruzon syndrome, a craniofacial condition where the bones in the head don't grow. Throughout our childhood, we had numerous operations that changed our appearance and saved our lives. Though we were born identical, with each surgery, we looked less like each other and less like ourselves. My changing appearance felt like being stripped of my identity. Who was I if I did not recognize my own reflection in the mirror? Who was my twin sister if she no longer looked like the person I knew? If she no longer looked like me? Though the physical aspect of our condition was sometimes painful, it was nothing compared to the emotional toll of navigating life with a facial difference. The everyday stares, comments, and subhuman treatment were constant reminders of our painful medical history and perceived shortcomings. We were treated as less attractive, less intelligent, and less worthy of basic respect. And yet, for the first 18 years of my life, I rarely spoke of my appearance or acknowledged that I was different. I got angry any time anyone asked me about my face, my differences. How dare they, I thought. I tried to deny that people made fun of me, even though it happened openly every time I was in public. If I could deny the way I was treated, I could pretend it wasn't happening. But ignoring my experiences meant denying an entire aspect of my identity. So no, I didn't write about all the magical moments of my childhood and teenage years. There are definitely some joyful memories and plenty of funny stories, but this memoir is mostly me exploring my differences, as honestly as possible. Throughout this book, you will see that I use the terms facial difference and facial disfigurement interchangeably. Both describe an appearance that differs from the norm. Both describe individuals with craniofacial conditions and noticeable physical differences. Both describe me. And faces like mine are not as rare as you might think. This is a global issue, but popular media rarely explores what it's like to look different. And though Zand and I were just two of millions of people around the world living with facial differences, we grew up thinking we were outsiders. We grew up feeling alone. Part of this isolation came from growing up without stories about disfigurement. Not stories we related to, anyway. Most of the stories I've seen, both as a child and as an adult, were written or told by people outside the facial difference community, by people who didn't understand the complexity of our experiences. When disfigurement and other facial differences are discussed in mainstream media, they are typically used as tools to signify that a character in a story is evil. Think Scar in Lion King and Dr. Poison in Wonder Woman. Or as a token of inspiration, for those without visible differences. Think Augie Pullman in Wonder. The derogatory treatment of people with facial differences isn't new. It has roots in physiognomy, a pseudoscience claiming a person's physical appearance represents their moral character. 
This ableist belief that a facial difference can indicate a lack of morality is how moviegoers, for example, know that characters like Scar and Dr. Poison are evil simply by looking at them. Without positive normal reflections of my experience to contradict these hateful depictions, I assumed it was true. This is why visibility is crucial. Without it, people with faces like Zan's and mine are pushed further into the margins. Even now, I'm disturbed by how easy it is for others to ignore our humanity simply because we do not look like them. People assume that because I had an unconventional appearance growing up, I did not have friends. People assume that because my eyes are crooked and far apart, I am not intelligent. People assume that because I do not meet arbitrary standards of beauty, I am not a strong, beautiful woman. This is why I wrote A Face for Picasso. I did not know of any children's or young adult novels about teenagers with Cruzon syndrome, and so I wrote the story I wished I'd had growing up. I start my story with a memory from middle school, because in that moment, in seventh grade, I began to view my life leading up to that point and everything that came after it in a new light. When I think about my life, I think of it in terms of before and after, before and after seventh grade, before and after doctors expanded my skull and face for the third time, before and after I was old enough to understand the emotional implications of my appearance changing overnight, before and after I had to discover who I was outside of my face, outside of my perceived ugliness. This is why you will find my story divided into three parts. Before, after, and healing. I start my story in seventh grade, then rewind and walk you through the things that led up to that point and everything that came afterward. Because for me, this is where it all began, my turning point. Seventh grade was when the pressure to fit in with my peers became inescapable and my inability to do so became undeniable. It was when I realized that the way I was treated by my peers was far worse than any surgery I'd had. Seventh grade was where I discovered that putting pen to paper and speaking my truth on my own terms would one day make me feel less alone. In middle school, I began to dream that one day I and others with Cruzon syndrome would finally be seen for who we are, normal. I used to understand beauty as little more than symmetrical features. My early definition of beauty was shaped by the white, western beauty standards that I grew up with. And as I write about beauty, you will see I use words like corrected and fixed when describing my appearance. This is the language that was used to describe my surgeries. This is the language I knew, the language I internalized. If my face had to change, I wanted it to be made into one that was acceptable to society. This is partially why I went to such great lengths to reach an unattainable standard of beauty. But my changing appearance and my desire to have a symmetrical face resulted in body dysmorphia and an eating disorder. Though my struggle with both disordered eating and a full-blown eating disorder plays a large role in my journey to healing, I've tried to be careful in how I write about it. So while disordered eating is woven throughout the narrative, I made the decision to not include the specifics of my experience with bulimia. I could not write about this aspect of my life in a way that was healthy for myself or for readers. It's an illness that never completely goes away, but something you learn to live with. And so, I do not want to glamorize it for those who are struggling. I only want to show how toxic beauty ideals impacted every aspect of my life. Our surgeries, like the golden ratio that you'll read about in chapter one, reached toward a very specific, white-centric standard of beauty. I did not understand this at the time, but the operations we had, as well as my obsession with achieving symmetry, reinforced impossible beauty standards, misogynistic ideals, and racism. Picasso, who plays a big role in this memoir, was a racist and misogynist. While I talk about his legacy at length, I don't focus specifically on his racism. It is an extremely important topic, but I don't have nearly enough knowledge to do it justice. I do want to acknowledge the basics of what I know to give you further context for his artwork. Picasso was an avid collector of African masks and textiles. Not because he cared about the culture or the function of the masks, but because he viewed African people the same way he viewed women, as objects he could use to further his own work. 
He appropriated African art and used African masks as a symbol of savagery, showing that physiognomy is rooted in both ableism and racism. He studied African art, copying the abstract nature of the works. This, along with his desire to depict more than one side of something simultaneously, was what inspired Cubism. For a deeper perspective on this topic, I encourage you to celebrate Black artists like Cherie Samba and Black art historians like Rosalind A. Walker, the senior curator of African art at the Dallas Museum of Art, and Denise Murrell, the associate curator for 19th and 20th century art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City who are working to decolonize modern art by highlighting the role of racism in Picasso's legacy and bringing attention to the erasure of black culture and African influence in art history. Writing A Face for Picasso helped me find my voice. In the same way I've separated my story into before and after, I've also separated myself. It is only by accepting and piecing together the many fragmented pieces of my identity that I found a path toward healing. I had to find the beauty in myself and in my story at every stage. So yes, this is a book about beauty. But more than that, it's a story of strength, survival, and sisterhood. It's a story, my story, about what it means to grow up with a disfigured face in a beauty-obsessed world. Alright, I hope that you're finding the introduction to A Face for Picasso interesting so far and that you are eager to hear more about Ariel's story. Next week, we'll be reading chapter one. Have a great weekend. See you next time. Bye.